So there's a couple different steps that really help create the framework to create lasting sobriety. And so what we've done over time, oh gosh, over two decades now, is we looked at what are the common components that each person that actually made it after treatment and the people that didn't or had continual relapses and what was the difference. And so we came up with a list of some items, some action items of what you wanna be just incredibly rigorously honest with really hammer in to, to write down, to do daily. And these are the core eight steps that we found that those working a strong program that got years and years sober versus those that went to treatment and ended up having a tough time once they left. And so without further ado, here are the keys to lasting sobriety. So the first thing is, is breathing. I know it sounds weird and you're thinking, what the heck, but it's breathing. If you think about it, when we use all our all we're really doing is changing our state. We're looking to feel differently than we currently do. And we're able to do a lot of this through breathing. Actually, I just read a study that talks about meditation and how it actually helps develop the prefrontal cortex. This is the part where, where rationalization, um, logic, all sorts of stuff happens. We're able to think things through. And so the, the more blood flow, the more use we get that part of our brain, we start making healthier choices. And so looking at, are you doing a morning meditation or breathing routine? How are you breathing when you're feeling stressed or triggered or something else? What are the, what are the breath thoughts? And what I mean by that is most times than not, a person is breathing really shallow, fast, as opposed to deep breathing, rooted. And so as weird and as ohm as that sounds, it's through this breath work that we are able to actually get some solution and ongoing lasting sobriety. So that's the first thing. It's in no particular order, but that's the first thing that we're going over. Second is your daily habitual patterns. What are your routines? What we see is when we get into a routine, such as I wake up at the same time, I go to bed at the same time. When I wake up, I go through this routine. Like for me, it's breathing exercises, I have a morning ritual that I do, I do a lot of uh, mental conditioning, emotional conditioning to make sure I can feel what I want, when I want, how I want, regardless of outside circumstances. And so also throughout the day, the morning routine is I spend time with my kids, same time every single morning on weekdays, it changes on weekends, but of having this routine, because by nature, we are routine-based creatures. And when I get outside of routine, it causes too much discomfort, However, I'm gonna really mess with your mind right here. If I stick too hard to routine and I don't have a change throughout, then we get too bored and boredom is a huge trigger. So we look to find that balance in routine of enough that it's consistent, that you have this, day, uh, this daily routine, these habitual patterns and what that looks like. And so I go to work at the same time, I come home at the same time, and I don't mean to make it sound so drab, but you want the routine. I go to, to X amount of meetings a day, I do spiritual work, I, I read the big book, I read the Bible, whatever that looks like for you to schedule that time and to create a routine. So that's the second thing is routines are so highly important. And then you switch it up, you add little tweaks here and there as you go, whether it's a couple weeks, a couple months, uh, for me, it's about every six months, I'll do routine and then I'll add some new things in as I learn more. So this continual growth of routine. The third thing, this is more ambiguous, more kind of out there, but is reshaping your identity. A lot of the times we see people identify as, well, I'm not good enough, I, I can't do this, I'm a failure, I'm a drug addict, um, whatever these different things are. And so by reshaping the identity, who do I want to be known as? There's a great exercise we do here and it's basically, uh, we, we reverse it where, okay, at the end, what do we want people to say about us? At the end, when people are at our, at our memorial and they're celebrating our long life, very, very long life, because we're living a new way, what do we want them to say about us? How do, they want, how do I want them to feel about me? And I start listing those things down. What is the identity I want to have? What are the beliefs that I want to have about myself, about the world, about other people? So this process of reshaping your identity and looking forward to the end, if you will, <clears throat> and seeing who do I want to be remembered as? What do I want people to say about me? How do I want them to think about me? And then we can reverse fill, and that's how we start shaping our identity. So we're able to shed the old identity, the shame, the guilt, all that, and start really focusing on this new identity. 
That's one key crucial aspect of this lasting sobriety is what is my identity today? How do I really change these core beliefs about myself and how I'm able to continue forward? So that's, that's the third thing. The fourth thing, which is really, really important, you can see they're all important, is environment. You know, I, I heard it best this way. And, and someone said, if you locked a person in a, in a crack house, if you will, for a year, they couldn't leave and they went in, not an addict, within a year, they would come out 100% guaranteed an addict because of their environment, locked in, forced. There's only so much willpower you can use before you start using and then the whole brain chemistry and psychology and addiction and it just, it, it gets crazy and gets deep and it goes, goes quick. Um, so th that's one argument. The other argument is if you got locked in with successful, positive, happy people, for a year you'd come out actually successful, happy, positive. So environment is huge. I think we did a video about this a while ago. Uh, I think I may have geeked out a little too much, but Bruce Lipton, there's a book called The Belief of Bio or uh, The Biology of Belief. And it talks about how important important uh, environment is. Actually so important, they took a cell, they split it in half so it's identical. They put one in a positive environment, one in a negative environment. In a negative environment, it mutated, it, it all sorts of issues were happening. On the positive environment, it actually flourished and began to multiply. So environment is such a key aspect. So we want to look at who are my friends? Who am I hanging out with? Is it this, this future, this ideal, this vision self and friends that that person would associate with people that bring me up or is it friends that actually tear me down? <clears throat> That's a huge part of environment. The other part is family. Now I know you can't choose your family, but how much, how much am I dealing with certain family aspects and am I in a positive environment when it comes to family or is it toxic or abusive? And then I got to go ahead and change that. Um, from work as well, free time, where I live, how I live. When we look at environment as a whole, that's another aspect that creates lasting sobriety. Also, when we have a healthy environment, it leads to better coping. And so what I mean by this is I call it a life team. I learned this from someone else, but a life team is seven to 10 people that continually build me up, that we are all looking to help each other. We're doing life together, but it's in a incredibly healthy way. If, um, if I'm hurting and I need to jump in the well, one or two of them jump in the well with me and say, I'm here for you. If I need to get out of the well, they're the ones to, to lower their hands and vice versa. So I'm in a life team, people that I can talk to throughout the week that are there for me emotionally, uh, mentally, and continue. That's the type of environment, um, a little, little hack, if you will, that life team. Also, openly sharing in your environment. Does the environment promote this sharing process of being able to share open? That's why meetings are so important because we're able to share openly without judgment and, and we shed that old skin. Also, an environment of constant growth. We grow or we die. And if we're not growing, even just a tiny bit every single day, challenging ourselves, that continual growth, it, the environment would need to support that. And then finally, never ending and constant gratitude. When I stay in a state of gratitude, no matter what, I continue, it, it gives the sense of hope. It helps me focus on the things that are great in life as opposed to this hopelessness and focusing on what I don't have. So focusing on what I have versus don't have leads to gratitude and helps create this healthy environment. So that's the fourth thing. The fifth thing is really healing at a core level and this continual growth that we just talked about. So how do you heal at the core level? Well, through treatment, through therapy, through different things. And we look at this as an ongoing process by this. We learn how to self confront. It is imperative that instead of allowing, or not allowing, but having to rely on others to confront us, because here's the way it works. When I use self-confrontation, almost always, not always, I don't have to worry about external confrontation. When it's internal and comes from myself, easiest analogy is when I'm driving on the freeway, using this, this, internal, um, this internal confrontation, this internal awareness, Okay, speed limit 65, I stay 65 to 70. I don't have to worry about external feedback coming in. If I don't utilize that self-confrontation and allow it to just open it up and I'm doing 90, at some point or another, that external confrontation is gonna come in and actually force me to adhere to what the laws or the rules are. Nature's the same way. Nature always wins. You ever notice reality wins only 100% of the time? 
<laughs> it wins every time. And so by healing at the core level, learning how to call myself, how to own different things, the self-confrontation is key. What stems from there is honesty. I have to be honest when I confront myself. I want to make sure I'm not lying to myself or thinking it's better than it is and just calling it really that it is. And then I'm able to do that work. And so that core level. And then the final thing is, is accountability that we talked about that life team, that, that living feedback to allow others to hold me accountable, it helps heal at the core level. So that's the fifth thing to this whole understanding of lasting sobriety. Next, the sixth is food and meditation. We already kind of talked about meditation, so I guess it's kind of a subset of one, if you will, but also what am I feeding myself? There's been so many studies, and as cheesy as this sounds, when I'm eating highly processed food, I feel sluggish when I don't feel good. So first of all, when I don't take care of myself, I don't feel good. When I don't feel good, I don't make healthy decisions. So really looking, how do I make sure that I'm taking care of myself, that I'm feeling good so I can continue to make healthy decisions? So that's number six. The seventh thing is servitude. Every single person that's doing well has some form of servantship, uh, of giving, of doing something, something greater than ourselves. That's, that's the whole point of this aspect, is getting outside of ourselves. And so learning um, how to be a good steward of life, if you will. Um, one of the things that I ascribe to is, is God created us, and this is not my life, it's God's life, and I am to be a good steward of this life. I can tell you this, it's easier to make healthier decisions when I know I need to take care of someone else's stuff than mine. At home, my stuff, I'm kind of like, eh, that's okay. But if someone lets me borrow something of theirs, I take such good care of it because I don't want to let someone else down. And so this whole idea of servitude and, and serving and being a good steward of this life, that's another aspect. That's why it's so big on sponsoring people, of continuing to give, um, to provide, to serve. So that's number seven. And then the eighth and final one is daily growth and innovation. We talked about before routine and, and looking at always growing and adding to that routine. So we wanna be structured, but not too structured. It's this idea, one of the best ones I've heard is, they call it the 1% rule. If every single week I can just grow 1%, whether I do 1% more, you think about it and go, oh, that's not that big at all. I can definitely do that. If we look at the end of the year, we have increased over 52%. It's a great analogy, it's a great thought process of how do I make sure that I'm growing daily and innovating and continuing to kind of wrap everything together. And so the quick eight rapid fire, the, the whole breathing and meditation aspect, but that diaphragmatic breathing to change state. Number two is the daily habitual patterns, being aware of what I'm doing. Number three is reshaping the identity. Number four is my environment. Number five is healing at that core level. Six is food and meditation, priming the mind. Uh, seven is the servant servitude or stewardship mindset. And then number eight is daily growth and innovation. Those are the eight things that we have seen launch a person day after day, week after week, year after year into sobriety for that lasting survival.